Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Sheckman. You all know the story of the group of blind men and the elephant. Each one touches the elephant in a different way in a different place, and each comes away with a totally different idea of what the elephant is. In a way, large subjects, large issues are like this. Understanding the financial crisis, understanding the totality of health care, and understanding the enormity and scope of climate change. Most of us know a little. The impact of coal, the air in China, the advantages of solar, the concern about rising sea levels, holes in the atmosphere, and of course the political noise surrounding the issue. Now with a new documentary, Time to Choose, by my guest Academy Award winning documentary filmmaker Charles Ferguson, we have both an in-depth and a 30,000 foot look at the totality of climate change and some of the real solutions that are taking place and must be expanded. Charles Ferguson is a filmmaker and writer. He is the director and producer of Inside Job, winner of the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature, and of No End in Sight, The American Occupation of Iraq, which was an Academy Award nominee as well. He's also the author of five previous books, and he's written for The Huffington Post, The Guardian, The New York Times, and numerous other publications. It is my pleasure to welcome Charles Ferguson to Radio Who, What, Why to talk about his new documentary, Time to Choose. Charles, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you for having me, sir. Great to have you here. I want to talk first about the idea and, and how it evolved of dealing with the scope of things that you've dealt with in this documentary, climate change, potential solutions, and climate change around the world, all in the context of essentially a 97 minute documentary. That was difficult, um, <laughs> without question. Uh, taking such an, an enormous subject and, and trying to convey it in such a short time, is uh, it's a very difficult thing to do, but it's also a very rewarding thing to do, and film helps. Um, there are indeed times when the picture is worth a thousand words, and uh, I tried very hard to convey visually the impact uh, both of what we're doing to the environment and the effects of climate change and also um, the reality and possibility of solutions to the climate problem. In approaching this, to what extent did you know very specifically the points that you wanted to hit, the things you wanted the public to understand, and how much of it evolved as you were working on the project? A great deal of it uh, came to light only after I started doing my research. Um, when, when I began making the film, I am ashamed to say that I actually didn't know that much about the subject. I, I had seen An Inconvenient Truth, uh, the first major documentary about climate change, of course, that was made 10 years ago. Um, but, it, and, and I have a general, I would say, awareness and, and affection for the natural world. Um, but I really did not know a great deal about either the problem or the solutions to it. And I found a great deal of what I learned to be extremely surprising. Uh, quite shocking and horrifying in some cases, and uh, unexpectedly optimistic in others. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was quite a surprising research project, actually. One of the things that you brought into this was not only the impacts of climate change, but also the impacts of environmental degradation that came about as a result of many of the processes that were contributing to climate change. That's uh, absolutely correct, and that was one of the surprises that I found. I, uh, I, I found that to a really extraordinary extent, the same things that are causing the long-term global climate problem are also causing much more immediate local environmental problems of many different kinds. Um, air pollution, water pollution, uh, pollution of water supplies, uh, public health problems, including cancer. Um, I, I was really quite shocked at that, and, and I was deeply shocked when I learned about the human cost of coal mining around the world. When, when I came to realize that coal mining in Asia had killed literally millions of people, I, I really was very, very surprised by that. Mm-hmm. I, quite surprised, quite horrified by that. Um, 
And then conversely, I, I was equally surprised in the opposite direction when I saw the public health evidence and the medical evidence that if you eat a diet of the kind that is compatible with long-term sustainability with regard to agriculture and land use, that you'd lead a much longer, much healthier life. Um, it's, it's rare to find circumstances in which so many good things go together. Did you understand in the context of this, particularly with respect to the economics of so much of it on a global scale, come to understand better what the pushback has been to something as obvious as climate change and the, some of the environmental degradation that has resulted from the coal industry, the oil industry, etc.? Yes, uh, and, and in fact, that was another surprise, was to, was to understand the degree to which um, the climate problem is linked to political corruption and economic inequality. It, that also was something that I had not understood at all, had not been aware of. And so it turns out that uh, our energy system now, the conventional fossil fuel energy system is uh, is one that's controlled by a very small number of people in part because you only need a very small number of people to uh, operate the oil industry and uh, and that has caused an enormous amount of political corruption and economic inequality around the world and of course the people who own an oil industry or an oil company are not very interested in uh, alternative sources of energy that uh, would reduce their wealth and their political power. And so you have enormous resistance from uh, sometimes from entire nations like Saudi Arabia and Russia and Venezuela, and sometimes from uh, corrupt governments and uh, in powerful industries, uh, the oil industry in Nigeria, for example, uh, even the oil industry in the United States. Yes, uh, energy is a very big business, and the people who control it currently make a lot of money, and they stand to lose a lot of money if we address the climate problem and change the way we produce energy. Does the complexity of it, the, all of the threads that you were just talking about, the environmental damage, the impact of, of climate change, the, the inequality that results from so much of this, does the complexity of the issue with so many threads coming together make it easier in your mind or harder to get the message out there and to get people to understand it? Uh, this might seem strange, but I think that the answer is that it's both easier and harder. And what I mean by that is it's one of these situations where, on the one hand, to make the change is very difficult because everything's connected to everything else, because the current system is so entrenched and so powerful. But uh, at the same time, if you can make the change, the benefits from making that change will also be so comprehensive and will touch every part of life and will result in improvements so large that it seems to me that in the end they're inevitable and inescapable. The question is one of time. The question is whether we're going to do this fast enough because we are facing a clock with regard to the climate problem. Were you also surprised by the diversity of attitudes around the world? I mean, you, some of the places where you showed potential solutions taking place, places as diverse as Indonesia and Kenya on the one hand and, and California on the other, and then, of course, other parts of, of our own country where, where nothing is happening. Yes, I, I was surprised by that, too. Uh, I, Another thing that I had not understood previously was that there are over a billion people in the world who don't have access to electricity um, and, and don't have access to conventional uh, large-scale energy of any kind. And so they're dependent on uh, cooking oil, heating oil, diesel generators, other very primitive and inefficient and expensive technologies. And that for them, 
uh, solar power, decentralized solar power, and also wind power in some cases are really uh, a remarkable revolution and a way for them to leapfrog over the the old-fashioned conventional electricity system and to get power very quickly and inexpensively. That was quite a revelation. And I was also uh, very impressed with how much California has been able to do. Uh, I live in California, and, uh, and I was raised in California, and I, until I started making this film, I did not realize that California was a global leader in addressing climate change and energy policy. Uh, and, and California is a very prosperous place. You know, California has been able to address these problems and continues to address them in a way that has not at all impeded uh, the development of the economy. In fact, California is doing extremely well economically. The largest, ironically, the largest problem California faces right now is a drought, which is in part caused by climate change. You have a, a powerful reputation. I mentioned in the introduction the, the Academy Award nominations, the Academy Awards, the documentaries you've been involved with. Were you at all surprised that nobody within the traditional energy business at coal companies or oil companies, etc., was willing to talk about this? Um, I was a little bit surprised, yes. It, it, was, it was clear in many cases that uh, my reputation had preceded me, that people knew that I did a lot of investigative work and that uh, when I did interviews, my questions were often tough. Uh, it, it, that certainly was an effect and, and clearly had an impact. But even so, I was still somewhat surprised. I, I spoke to or tried to speak to literally hundreds of uh, people in the fossil fuel industry and in industrial agriculture. And very, very few would speak with me, even privately and off the record. A few did. I, I was able to have uh, private off the record conversations with about a half dozen very senior executives in the world oil industry, for example, and uh, two executives in the coal industry. But I was surprised that literally nobody would allow themselves to be interviewed on camera. And that, that was, to me, that was telling. That said something. And what was your sense of what they were afraid of? Well, it's, it's kind of corny, kind of a cliche, but I think they were afraid of the truth is the honest answer, is the real answer. I think they were afraid of the truth. We certainly see it in, in some of these big companies. They realize that some of these changes are coming. And in fact, some of these companies are, are even trying to get out ahead of them. Uh, a number of the executives that I spoke to privately uh, admitted that there was a problem and, um, and admitted that in the long run, their companies and their industries were going to have to change. But um, they were all evasive to varying degrees about exactly what that meant. And they were also evasive or dishonest about what their companies actually did. Uh, so in fact, there are a number of energy companies, including most of the um, major global oil companies who have publicly stated that uh, climate change is a serious problem, that they agree that the science has demonstrated that and that it needs to be addressed, and they've stated that they're publicly in favor of a carbon tax of some kind. However, if you look at their lobbying activities and who and what they actually support, it is very unclear that they really are putting their money where their mouth is. Mm -hmm. uh, there's often a very big gap between what they say in general and where they put their money. And, uh, and in fact, there are several uh, law enforcement investigations underway now. Uh, and the focus of the investigations is whether the energy industry uh, lied to the public about the nature of these problems earlier before they even admitted publicly um, about their existence. And so I, I was 
overall not impressed with the private conversations that I had on this subject. And, and in fact, there have been several cases. For example, Shell Oil is probably regarded as the most progressive of the global oil companies with regard to its public statements about climate change and the need for a carbon tax and so on. But Shell Oil was still, uh, until very recently, trying to get permission to drill for oil in the Arctic. And uh, if you really believe that climate change is uh, a great problem and that two-thirds of all fossil fuels are going to have to remain in the ground, then you don't spend billions of dollars trying to drill for oil in the Arctic. What was the nexus, as you saw it, between all of these issues that we've been talking about, Charles, and political leadership, both in the West and around the world? Well, uh, certainly I got a lesson in how the, how important money is in politics. And the, the greater the dependence of a national economy and a nation's government on uh, fossil fuel energy and money from fossil fuel energy, the less likely they are to be progressive about these issues. Uh, it's, it's not a coincidence that um, many of the regions that are most progressive with regard to the climate problem are regions that are affected by the climate problem, but that don't have uh, a very heavy dependence economically on fossil fuel energy. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I did also see in some cases that uh, enlightened, informed public opinion uh, can, can be very helpful and can overcome that kind of resistance. Uh, and the state of California is an example. The state of California actually has a lot of oil in it. And, uh, and the oil industry has been and continues to be fairly significant in uh, the California economy. And the same is true of industrial agriculture. But at the same time, the economy is diversified. And, and California has a very educated population. And uh, in California, the state government actually works extremely well. There's very little debate about the need to deal with the climate problem. There's been bipartisan uh, effort and consensus in climate-related and environmental legislation, and the system seems to be working very well. So you know, I, I, saw, I saw bad things and I saw good things. Where did you see the worst things? Oh, um, well, I would say that Appalachia is pretty hard to beat. It's, uh, there's a section of the film about mm -hmm. the impact of um, mountaintop removal coal mining on uh, Appalachia, especially West Virginia. And, uh, and there's much more about that that I just didn't have time to put into the film. And in fact, some people who saw uh, early versions of the film that had more of that material said, you know, you have to take this out. It's just too depressing. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll make people, you'll have trouble getting people to watch the film if you show too much of this in the film. Um, the, the impact of Appalachia, of coal on Appalachia, has been devastating. Uh, economically, politically, in terms of public health, environmentally, aesthetically, in every way. It's been, it's been just devastating. Uh, black lung, the occupational disease that coal miners get from being exposed to coal dust, uh, is actually a growing problem in Appalachia now. It's, it, it's not declining. It's, it's getting worse. And uh, a very high fraction of the people that I spoke to in Appalachia had black lung. Most of the coal miners that I spoke to had black lung. And it's a very rough disease. You know, it kills your lungs and it kills you. So there's that. Then there's the impact of the chemical pollution caused by uh, coal mining, both conventional coal mining and not top removal coal mining. Um, it's polluted the water. I saw that myself personally. 
and and that water pollution has now been linked to a wide variety of diseases, including many kinds of cancer. It it devastates the environment. You know, there, there are images in the film of what mountaintop removal coal mining looks like. It's it's horrifying, and the devastation is such that no other industry will locate in the region, which means that the region is totally dependent on coal mining economically. And that, of course, means that the region is poor because coal mining doesn't make people wealthy. Uh, And the result is this kind of vicious circle where poverty and coal mining lead to more poverty and more dependence on coal mining. And uh, and to uh, life expectancy that's six years less than the American national average. Um, I, I was really quite appalled and quite shocked that something like that could be permitted to exist in the United States. And finally, Charles, ideally, what do you hope that that people take away from the documentary? What do you hope that the film accomplishes? Uh, Well, a combination of a sense of urgency about the problem and a sense of optimism about the solution. This is a solvable problem, and we could solve it in a way that would enhance our lives and keep us prosperous, in fact, make us more so, and improve our health and improve our lives. Um, it won't happen automatically. We have to, we're going to have to work for it, and, and we're going to have to do it fast, because if we don't do it fast, this problem really will become terribly grave, but could, can deal with it, and I hope we do. Charles Ferguson, it's his documentary just out. It's time to choose. Charles, I thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. And thank you for listening and joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you'll join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share it and help other people find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.